we go. Well, I'm um, really excited. I, I always say this, but I am actually really <laughs> excited because uh, I'm joined by uh, Scott Young because he's been busy. He's got another book yeah. out and I absolutely love the first one. And the second one I've had a sneak preview of and I'm loving it as well. So, uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me back. Um, so, yeah, the the new book out, Get Better at Anything. I mean, we'll get into it in a minute, but just generally, like, you know, kind of what's been going on. Tell me a little bit about the kind of, you probably need to give a little bit of backstory to right. um, people who may not have heard you before or come across the stuff from the previous times we've spoken. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be really keen to just uh, get a bit of uh, who you are and what you're about, and then yeah, we can get yeah. stuck into it. So in 2019, I published a book, uh, Ultra Learning. It went on to be a Wall Street Journal bestselling book. And that book sort of documented some of mine and other interesting people's intensive self-directed learning projects. So, you know, there are people in the book who speak a dozen languages, who, you know, self-started um, video game companies where they did the art and the music and everything all by themselves. Uh, people who were, you know, really good at lots of things that, you know, they taught themselves how to do. And uh, that that book uh, was probably the basis of the last conversation that we had. And uh, yeah, this book that I wrote, um, I've been working on it for the last, uh, basically since Ultra Learning finished, I started working on this book. And this book dives deep into some of the fundamental science and ideas of how learning works. So I, I sort of divide it into these uh, see, do, feedback kind of principle. And we have these 12 maxims to split it up. But yeah, but basically this has been my life for the last four or five years, just doing tons of research and digging deep into some of these principles. Oh, I also had two kids, by the way, in the in intermediate time. So I've been keeping busy. <laughs> you definitely have. Um, so um, just the genesis of ultra learning, because yeah. you may as well go right back to that. Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, I'd love to know more about... Um, you know, kind of like what the sort of whole, like how you even got into the space of deciding to write right, a book about yeah. learning, because it's an it's an endlessly fascinating area for me. <laughs> so I can just consume yeah. anything you put out. So so if I rewind back the clock about, uh, it would be like maybe 12 years ago now. Wow, it's, it sounds weird to say this. But, you know, a little over a decade ago, I was graduating from from university and I had noticed that MIT puts a lot of their classes online for free. So this is still true. You can go on MIT's website and there's like, you know, some class that they have. They have their lectures recorded. They're like, these are the assignments. This is the assignment key. This is the final exam. This is the solution key. And I got this idea of like, has anyone ever tried to uh, learn what MIT teaches in a four-year computer science curriculum? Has anyone ever just tried to like download the materials and teach themselves that? So this became a project I called the MIT Challenge, where the goal was to try to learn MIT's computer science curriculum. And the sort of twist of this is that I wanted to try to do it in 12 months. And um, I talk about that in a lot more detail in my, my first book, Ultra Learning, but that became the first kind of project that sort of put me on this path of being a, an eccentric guy who talks about learning. I did after that, I followed with a project called The Year Without English, where I went with a friend. We went to Spain, Brazil, China, and Korea to learn the languages of each of those countries. And the sort of twist of that project is that whenever we would land in the country, we'd only speak the language we were trying to learn. So when we landed in Spain, for instance, we tried to the greatest extent possible to only speak in Spanish to each other, as well as the people we would meet. And so I documented some of those projects that started with ultra learning. And when I started writing the book, ultra learning, I started doing research into not just sort of my own personal experiences and what works for me, but really getting into a lot of the cognitive science, because there's just this vast amount of research on how learning works, what works, what doesn't work. And it's kind of a complicated mess if you're trying to get a total picture of all of it. And so I started doing that in, in ultra learning. I, I talk about some of those principles in the book, but then that really morphed into, you know, a real multi-year long quest to really get a good understanding of that and try to consolidate that for uh, for a learner. So if someone was interested in, in a lot of these details, uh, yeah, the new book, Get Better at Anything, goes into a lot of that uh, that basic research. Wow. Now, you see, I, I think I must have missed a bit where you went and did the language stuff. So you yeah. went down the full full immersion route, like you immersed yeah. yourself in the language. And it's interesting. Yeah. I've spoken about this on the podcast with a number of people before about like the, the constraint almost of not having English as a fallback. Yeah. Did you find that, that that meant that you essentially got like a rapid adoption of the language? 
Yeah. So I think it's important to kind of clarify what the immersion does, because I think when I talk about it to the outside, um, people who haven't been in this exact situation before, uh, there's often some magic uh, ascribed to immersion. Like, like, it's just like you, you're just in this environment and there's just like through osmosis, the language is coming into your being. And I mean, there is an advantage to that, but where we found the immersion really, really valuable, and this is particularly valuable if you're doing a kind of travel-based project. So this is my advice, my standard advice to anyone who is like, you know, I'm going to go live in, uh, you know, Paris for a year. I'm going to go uh, travel to Colombia. What should I do? The advice I give is to start with trying to speak the language as much as you can and to the exclusion of English as much as you can from a very early period. And why I give that advice is because when you land in a new country, one of the first things you do is you sort of set up your network. You, you meet people, you make friends, you set up your routines. And if those happen to be in English, you end up making a little bubble of English around yourself. So even though you're living in, let's say, France or South Korea or wherever, you're in this little pocket of English within that broader country. And it can take a long time to learn because if you're only spending, let's say, less than 10% of your time speaking French or Korean or what have you in this environment, then, you know, it's just simple math says that it should take probably about 10 times as long to get the same amount of exposure of the language. And so this whole, uh, you know, from the very first moment you land, you only speak in like really bad Spanish has this advantage that, yes, your Spanish isn't very good, but you're meeting lots of people who will learn to interact with you in Spanish. And that, it turns out, means that you're getting probably about not just like 10% more exposure to the language, but probably about 10 times more. And it means that you're going to be acquiring at least the basics of conversational fluency much faster. So there's lots of nuances in language learning. And I'm not sure that I would have the exact same advice for someone who is, let's say, you know, I'm going to be sitting in my house in Alabama and I want to learn Japanese. What's the best way to do it? It's probably going to be a bit of a different strategy. But definitely if you're traveling, if you have that opportunity to go somewhere for at least a couple months, I think that's probably the best way to do it. And it certainly worked for me and, and for other people that I documented in that book. It's, it's, it's fascinating for me because um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in different parts of the world. And mm -hmm. one of the periods of time when I was around about four or five, we lived in uh, in a place called Guinea in West Africa, which is a, a French speaking okay. uh, country. So I was completely bilingual at the age of six. And yeah. I now find whenever I go to France uh, and I start conversing with people, because a lot of it you lose, right? Yeah. And um, yeah. so I go start conversing with people and like words come out of me that I don't even know I know. <laughs> yeah. And do you have a nice like West African accent too when you're speaking French? That like, Because I'd love that, you know. Uh, um, no, I mean, I think, uh, I think for language learning, I think, and I document this in ultra learning. It, it's one of those, it's one of those examples where a lot of us have an experience learning it in a school context where we are not often that successful, where, uh, you know, I have, you know, if you survey people who've been through a French class, the majority of them would not feel comfortable speaking in French. And that maybe is even true after multiple years of taking French classes. Uh, same is true of, you know, how many people have like, I've got, you know, two years on my Duolingo streak, but like, you know, God forbid you have a conversation with me, that would be terrifying, right? <laughs> and so there, that's one of my my strongest examples of where like, an alternative approach to doing things can, can be so much more effective, that really the method is just kind of determines your your performance. So there, there's, there's, I don't want to say that that is true of every single field, that there's like some way of doing 10x what, what you're doing if you use the right method. But for language learning, it definitely seems to be the case that, you know, the way most people approach it is just not going to get them to a, a place where they feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So um, having immersed yourself in the world of learning, yeah. and then obviously the you know, this is the next book. And what I kind of like about this one is you've gone in a slightly different direction because I think you've got a bit more practical now. So it's not just yeah. necessarily about the kind of the knowledge acquisition piece. It's the application of, and mm. essentially you're getting into my world, which is skill. So of course, this is like, this is like the new Bible. So tell me about <laughs> the, the genesis of that. And then maybe we'll dive into some of the specifics because yeah. I've got some interesting things I want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think like one of the questions that I get a lot is uh, like, didn't you write a book about learning? Like ultra learning was also about learning. And it's sort of like, isn't this book also about that? But I think 
the way you design a book, you you end up highlighting some things and omitting other things. So the the bare truth of it is that I could like I love this topic and I could probably write like 20 books on it if they'd let me, if the readers would like to read them all. But when I started writing this book, the real genesis was hearing the story that I opened the book with, which is about Tetris players. And so to just give a little bit of background, Tetris comes out in the early 1990s. It's this phenomenon. It's, you know, people are obsessed with it. People are playing the game so much that there's like people writing op-eds about how um, people are hallucinating falling blocks <laughs> it, when they're doing daily activities. They call it the Tetris effect. So this is like a major landmark game. But if you look at the performance of the best people, so the most obsessed people, the people who are playing all the time, who are the best at this game, and you look at like what scores they're getting, how good they are at the game, they're like nothing close to what 12 and 13-year-old kids can do now. So to just use some like, Simple examples. One of them was in the old game. It had six digits for the score. So the best score you could get was 999-999. And this was sort of long thought to be a, like a pseudo impossible target because the way the game works is it just gets harder and harder to play. So eventually you lose and usually you lose before you hit this amount. And it took about 20 years before someone could document themselves actually doing this. Whereas in a recent Tetris tournament that was held, I think it was something like this score was hit about 40 times and like 14 different people all did it. So this is over the span of about a weekend. So what changed? Why are people so much better at Tetris now than they were before? And the, the YouTuber, John Green, is, he was the one who brought me to this um, story, gave a really good explanation, which I agree with, which is that the environment that people played in changed. So back in the 90s, the way you learned to play Tetris is that, you know, you, you fiddled around with it yourself. You figured out a few things. Maybe like your friend's older brother was like, oh, yeah, do this thing. Or you got you to do this first to play well. And, and you'd pick up a few tricks. But essentially, all the players were isolated from each other. There wasn't that much ability to learn from other people. In contrast, you know, the 12, 13-year-old kids who are these Tetris prodigies today live online. They can see video footage of not just like what a person's doing, but how they're holding the controller with their hand. That turns out to be really important that there's like certain button pressing techniques that are essentially necessary to play at really high levels and they're not obvious. And so these kids are really good because they're better able to learn from other people. And this is just a story that it, it didn't fit into the ultra learning framework that I had kind of made up, but I thought it was important because we're not talking about like one player or, you know, one prodigy who's really good. We're talking about the entire ability for a domain to improve and for people to learn in general based on these factors. So, so in the book, uh, get better at anything. I try to uncover some of these factors. So one of them was what we're talking about, this seeing learning from other people is so important, but there's also lots of other factors. And I wanted to try to highlight some of these systematic differences that if you change some variable in how people practice or what kinds of feedback they're getting or how they're able to learn from examples of other people, you can get dramatically different levels of, of progress and how important that is when we're trying to make progress ourselves. Well, what I find interesting, um, I, I love that Tetris, Tetris story. There's obviously a movie about that as well, isn't there now? Uh, about the yeah, whole well, Genesis. The, the Tetris creation story is also like, uh, it's, it's also a wild story. Um, you know, that like, I, I kind of allude to it in one paragraph, but it's also a wild story how that game came about too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, and what I love about that and what that really spoke to me about was something that I guess is a big part of the thesis of this particular show, which is, environment and changes of environment and its ability to influence uh, an individual's response yeah. like you say so before those abilities to connect were there and share and learn from each other and all those sorts of things like you say everybody was just sort of doing the experimental process which mm -hmm. you know they you do you, obviously people can get really good just on their own but it just takes them an awful lot longer and less of them can yeah. do it yeah, I mean, I think this this sort of phenomenon where the connectivity of the of the domain, the ability to learn from other people and those changing and changing progress, that's pretty universal. So there there's a story that I was going to make a bigger feature of it in the book, but then it was just already like, you know, you have to just cut things down. So there's only a paragraph in the actual book, but I did all this research on um on alchemy. And so alchemy seems like kind of a funny subject, but the sort of popular impression people have of alchemy is that it's magic, it's mysticism, it's something vaguely supernatural. But really, it was just sort of early chemistry. This was just like people who didn't have the right theory of chemistry trying to figure out how when you mix stuff together, you get other stuff. How does that work, right? 
And uh, there's lots of examples. I, I, I cover the research of um, the chemist and historian Lawrence uh, Principe uh, quite quite uh, heavily in that book. And he talks about how, you know, a lot of alchemists ran experiments. They did, you know, they they were doing things where they were trying to figure out stuff, figure out what the real theory of matter was. And they were they were doing this work. But one of the key differences, and this is sort of, I think, what created the uh, schism between, you know, the continuation of alchemy and then suddenly you have chemistry and you have, you know, actual laws, actual signs being created, was that the alchemists believed in secrecy. They believed that it they didn't want this knowledge spreading too widely. They only wanted people who had the right kind of clever gifts to be able to understand it. Part of this was just this link to this idea of like turning base metals into gold. There was a sort of like this fear that, okay, we can't let that knowledge go too widely. And so there was a lot of secrecy around that or, or, you know, elixirs of life or whatever. There was, there was this element of secrecy. And so you have ideas that like alchemical textbooks where they, they put the recipe for how to do some chemical reaction in this just fantastical picture with like griffins and like two headed snakes and this kind of thing. And so the chemist or the alchemist in this case was supposed to look at this image and through their extensive lore, be able to be like, okay, well this two headed snake is this chemical. And because it's over here, you must be doing this with it. But this is like a really bad way to communicate information on following an experiment. In contrast, like Robert Boyle, who kind of kicked off um, scientific chemistry, you know, when he does his experiments with the air pump, he has like these detailed drawings of like exactly what apparatus he used in like, this is the experiment I did and these are the exact measurements I got. And so the difference in communicating the knowledge, not, not the idea of experiment, not the idea of like having a theory of matter, that is what allowed that field to progress. And so it makes you think about how many of the fields that we operate in often have this kind of like tacit, unspoken knowledge, this sort of opaque, I don't understand how this works process and how that makes it often very difficult for people to um, acquire real skill. When I, when I read that uh, passage, you made me really reflect on, um, uh the world of sports coaching because obviously yeah. the world of sports coaching is basically in my mind uh like all about how to help others get better at things mm -hmm. and in order to do that we have to get better ourselves looking for new methods and approaches yeah. but it strikes me that a lot of coaching and coach education or particularly coach education is a bit like alchemy because many practitioners once they get like quite good and they build a reputation they're they can be quite secretive because they don't necessarily yeah. want their methods to be shared yeah. with others because it gives them a competitive advantage. So it's like they're finding finding gold. But equally, it, and it also then struck me as well that that this the way knowledge is shared and passed from from one generation to the next has some similarities as well because I think you often I, I often found within the world of within with the world of coaching is like that things aren't always very clearly documented people don't mm -hmm. generally it's got a lot better recently but up to fairly recently people didn't genuinely document their approaches and their methods it was almost this what you call folk yeah. pedagogy people sort of pass me they do it secretly sort of you know person yes. to person when they've got some trust with somebody as yeah. opposed to put their work out there and allow others to see it like thankfully like i said it's changed now but for a long time it was very much like that Oh, no, I completely agree. I mean, that that was sort of my takeaway from looking at this is that the default for most skills and domains is that it's really confusing and opaque and people don't explain and document things like in some ways our experience with school where we learn these like extremely, you know, uh, well codified, well specified sort of skills like if you're learning to read, you know, there's a million books about not only what you know, how reading works, but, you know, the right way to teach reading and this kind of thing. And so these extremely transparent skills are are not the norm. The norm is, uh, you know, okay, some guy knows this, it's just one guy and he knows the right answer and you have to know that person to learn from him. And that's just sort of how it's been, I think, for, for most of human history. So it's just interesting to do document the Tetris example, because it's not the case that like, well, Tetris was a, was a sort of an outlier and now it's like most of the world. No, no, no. Most things are still like Tetris in the early days. And it makes you really wonder how much performance improvement could be unlocked if you were able to take some of these sort of murky, ill-defined skills and put them under the light of, you know, the, the kind of practice that we expect of more well-defined domains like, um, you know, like athletics or things like that. Yeah, I mean... So there's there's a lot in here. I kind of almost don't know where to start. And I'm like yeah. I'm really terrible when I read things because I'm a bit like a 
kid in a candy store. I sort of flit yeah. about at the things that are kind of interesting. You know, I'm not very good. At, you've probably spent a lot of time crafting a narrative arc and I'm ruining it by jumping around. But anyway, um, lots of stuff took my interest. interest. Um, let me just jump into one. You talk sure. a bit about variability over repetition. Yeah. And I'd love you to expand on that because that's obviously a big theme of, of this show. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a this is sort of an interesting set of research. But the idea is that when you practice something repeatedly, you get uh, uh, you get better at doing the thing that you're doing. Right. So if you're practicing some sort of movement or some sort of skill or some sort of protocol, you get better at doing it. And if you practice a lot of different things in the same session, your improvement is slower. And so that sort of suggests, okay, well, we should be, you know, doing more repetition, more practice. But there's a lot of interesting experiences that show that when you do the kind of varied practice, so you practice your backhand with your forehand kind of interleaved, or you're, you know, practice one kind of shot with another shot. So we're, I'm using athletic examples, uh, or you do one kind of math problem interleaved with another problem. It slows how quickly you acquire the underlying skills, but it makes it faster to acquire new skills. And so this is, I think, a kind of surprising result because so much of our knowledge about like what we should be doing when we're practicing comes from this direct experience of like how fast am I getting things? How quickly do I seem to be learning? And this is one example where doing things that seem to make it slower for learning that make it harder for you to acquire the skill nonetheless make it easier for you to uh, learn new skills or for you to develop um, greater abilities later. So I think it's one of those areas where you know, a lot of our design of curricula is based on, okay, we do unit one and then we do unit two and then we do unit three because superficially our observation in that situation is that, well, they're learning a lot faster than if I mix it all together. But the mixing it all together is sometimes uh, better for acquiring the, you know, unit seven when you've gone one through six, right? And and I, I love the fact that, you know, um, you reminded me again when I was reading that there was a, there's a, a gentleman who's been on the podcast who's like um very very immersed in the world of um sort of uh environment environments as learning modalities mm -hmm. who said to me that um people think that variability is noise it's kind of gets in the way um yeah. while you're learning the particular thing that you're learning yeah. what he's saying is no variability isn't noise it's signal you kind of need yeah. it in order yeah. to help you then with the other things well yeah so one of the theories of why variability helps is that and I'm going to oversimplify a little bit here the idea, but that there's kind of two parts when you're performing a skill. One is performing the action, the procedure, the routine you've learned. So, you know, if you're doing an algebra problem, it's how do you solve this kind of algebra problem? If you're doing a, you know, tennis backhand serve, it's, you know, the movement of the tennis backhand serve. But then there's a different part of the skill, which is very important, which is choosing to apply that pattern, <laughs> choosing to use that technique. And mm. when you practice in a repetitive, highly consistent environment, you do get better at that particular technique. But what is impoverished is because the environment is highly predictable, you don't train much ability for how do you know when do you use it. And in real life, most of the difficulty of what we learn is when do you use knowledge that you learn? I mean, if you break it down simply enough, almost every skill, like the little component parts you could teach almost anyone, right? Like, I mean, there are some skills that maybe it takes a bit of practice to get, but, you know, doing one action, one repetition is not usually the crux of the difficulty. The crux of the difficulty is that, you know, dozens of things you can do and you have to pick the right one. And so this sort of suggests that as for skills of even modest complexity and things like this, this variable practice is very important. And we kind of do our, do ourselves a disservice because we're not training that ability to pluck out the right thing that we need to do in the right time. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why I originally, one of my, I think it's the second podcast I ever released was called the war on drills because it was designed <laughs> designed to challenge the notion that if we learn a whole series of kind of isolated movements yeah. that in very, very discreet ways, and then we, the, 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 the sort of, I think the idea was that, you know, that, that you aggregate up all these discreet movements and then you become yeah. like a world-class performer. And actually turns out, uh, kind of works out, it works the other way. So we, my suggestion was maybe we don't actually need to have uh, loads and loads of children in queues waiting to have a go at a very, very isolated movement. We could do things more playfully and therefore we could have more fun while we're learning. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's, uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence that like for movement skills and stuff too, it's not simply, um, it's not simply that we are just like 
it, like, it, you know, applying an algebra formula, there's sort of a rule that you're following that you just sort of apply the rule and it will work every time. Whereas a lot of movement skills, a lot of motor programs, um, we actually kind of store the knowledge of how to perform that skill at a fairly abstract level because, uh, you know, we have to adjust it to so many different variables that are going to change from time to time. So uh, it hasn't come out on my website yet, but I have a review of like one of these um, longer textbooks covering sort of motor learning theory. And that has been a sort of area of scientists of like what is stored in the brain when we learn movements. And it seems to be quite abstract that like a lot of the specific details of how you move. So like which muscles are involved, the speed of the movement, the power, all these things are sort of dynamic and can be set on the fly. And so it means that if you are practicing in a very uh, kind of constrained setting, you're not really testing enough variation, not enough of the range of the movement to really get that kind of abstract picture, which is what you need. So I think that is a problem with, um, with, a, with a lot of athletic training is that you, you know, if you're doing things with the orange pylons and the orange cones, I mean, maybe it's helpful if a, a student's really struggling, like, you know, to, to kind of, okay, this is the basics to understand it. But beyond a certain point, it's going to be hard because you're, you're essentially learning it in such a narrow range of circumstances. You're not going to get a good generalization of the movement. And the yeah, I like the word that word abstract. There's a because there's a, there's a there's a real danger, isn't there? That actually you, particularly with a growing body, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and cognitive abilities growing and yeah. maturation and all those sorts of things. Yeah. That actually the movements you learn as a child, particularly if you do them in such a sort of very discreet and yeah. very it almost becomes like you you kind of get a movement that you can't like get out of, you know, yeah. and you're going to need to adapt as your body changes. So in many ways, you're much better off sort of keeping the 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 movement repertoire right. much shallower earlier and allowing them to mm -hmm. deepen later. Yeah, yeah. No, there is some research. I know uh, David Epstein highlighted in his book Range that for sports in particular, um, children seem to do better when they have more diverse athletic uh, involvement uh, at younger ages they do better at elite levels which is um you know it, it's an interesting idea especially since in a lot of like intellectual pursuits we know that um you know not suggesting that everyone should do this with their kids but you know a lot of world class performers in let's say chess or music or some of these things which are a little bit more intellectual start from a very very young age so it's very interesting that athletics often shows this sort of pattern where um, you know, doing a bunch of different sports when you're younger is maybe more beneficial, even if you're only going to be a tennis player or a golfer or, or what have you. Yeah, they like contribute to your overall athleticism and they give yeah. you other dimensions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you you led me on to something else which I wanted to talk to you about because I sort of took, like linked to this notion of variability. So some of, I think, a lot of that people, and this is one of the phrases, if I, if I, had, a, if I had a pound for every time I hear this phrase said to me, is this idea of muscle memory so you know you've got a whole section on the idea that the mind is not a muscle <laughs> yeah 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 so this is this is one chapter that um i mean every every like i feel like in a book like this sometimes it, there's the chapters where you're like oh, people are going to really like this chapter because it's telling them something they want to hear and then there's the other chapters where you're like people need to hear this but i don't know whether they're going to like it and i think the the thing that i got from learning the research is this is a real under discussed area because <laughs> You read a lot of the academic research and there has been for basically a hundred years, I would say a pseudo consensus on the idea of transfer, which is that the ability to learn one skill and how it applies to the other. So if you learn chess, how does it apply to doing, you know, business reasoning? If you learn music, how does it apply to like being creative? If you learn programming, how does it apply to problem solving? When you carefully study these things, transfer tends to be low outside of domain. So I'm talking not about, you know, you learn JavaScript and then are you a better Python programmer? You learn to play tennis. Are you good at racquetball? Pretty much everyone agrees that that kind of transfer happens and is pretty common. But the sort of far transfer where you learn one skill and then how does that affect you for learning a completely different skill? It's kind of hard to find. It's difficult to find. It doesn't show up that much. And, and so part of the reason I think people get seduced by this idea that, you know, this is a, a reliable way to get good at um, skills broadly is that we have this metaphor that the mind is like a muscle. So to use the example, if you lift a weight with your arm and your bicep gets bigger and stronger, I would expect it to be stronger also for carrying groceries and for doing all sorts of other things. Now, maybe not 100%, you know, lifting a weight is a little different than lifting groceries, but broadly speaking, that's how muscles work. You have bigger muscles, stronger muscles, you can lift more. 
the mind doesn't seem to be built like that. It doesn't seem to be the case that doing some intense mental activity that is, involves one sort of domain just makes you mentally smarter, clever, have better memory, better reasoning in another domain. Um, and so the, the best sort of like counter theory to this is people talk about brain training and brain training is like super popular. Maybe you see those little ads that are like for brain training games on the side. And they really appeal to the fact that people have this idea that this is how the mind works, that the mind is like a muscle. And if you do some kind of Sudoku puzzles, for instance, you're just going to be cleverer when you're reasoning about things that don't have to do with numbers or grids or what have you. And again, there's a lot of evidence I cited in the book that this just seems to be not the case. It's not how the brain seems to work. And I think a better metaphor for how the brain works is that the brain is sort of a collection of tools. And so those tools, I don't want to say that they're just, you know, knowing facts or knowing procedures. They're a little bit more complicated than that. But these collection of tools are quite specific. So each thing that you learn is for dealing with something fairly specific, but the kind of our intelligence, our intellectual abilities is from having a broad collection of tools, is from having a diverse and well-honed toolkit. And so I think the toolkit metaphor is a better way of thinking about it, that when we are trying to be you know, good in a language, for instance, it's knowing a lot of words and, and knowing when to use those words and knowing the grammar. That's a big part of learning the language. It's not some sort of you know language muscle in our brain that just strengthens with practice. So I think this idea is very important because it, it tells us sort of, where we should expect abilities. Like if we're trying to get good at something, we need to do practice in the domain that we're trying to practice. And then also if we're trying to build broader abilities, if we want to be, you know, like you said, generally athletic, we want to be generally good problem solvers, then we need to have a broad and diverse array of tools. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing for me and what, what I was thinking about uh, when I was reading this bit as well was like how do the tool how do the tool how are the tools generated so sort of the traditional mm -hmm. linear we will talk about non-linear learning in a minute yeah, yeah. but um the the traditional notion is um that you know you almost like insert a tool into somebody um you know almost like a piece of software yeah. um and then at some stage they're going to know how to like you know they're going to have some sort of and in my world you know it's usually a movement yeah. a technique or something along those lines so we practice it we insert it it's a software program and then you just like play the program when it's needed but um increasingly you know the the the, the literature is now moving towards the idea that um actually the tools are kind of they they get they're given to you but they're they're more sort of dynamic in the sense mm. of like your response to the environment is is essentially a tool, but the tool is kind yeah. of more flexible than that. It's not like it's a rigid yeah. tool. It's actually something very flexible that you can use in lots of different ways with different levels of creativity. And so it's kind of that, that whole dynamic sort of uh, environment, human interaction is yeah. constantly at play, which is why some researchers don't use the phrase skill acquisition anymore because it, it sort of evokes the notion that, you know, you, you acquire a skill and then you have it forever. And they, they now yeah. talk about this notion of skill attunement. It's a variable dynamic process of constantly adapting to different environment stimuli. Yeah. I mean, the, the motor skills literature is really interesting too, because it's pretty clear that, um, being able to perceive the environment and respond with our musculature to, you know, be effective in that environment is one of the most complicated things we do. Um, that in some ways doing math problems is like, it's relatively trivial. Like it's pretty easy to program a computer program that can like, you know, do arithmetic, but it's even at today's level with our, you know, AI and everything like that, we still can't make good robots like our robots still kind of suck like so yeah. it's it's pretty clear when you look at from a from a computational perspective that's something we take for granted being able to like walk around and move in the world uh which we don't do with much thought at all is one of the most complicated things we do like it just at a on a, on a very basic level it is and i think you're probably right that there is um whatever is being stored in the head and even the, the word stored is maybe misleading here but whatever is in your head that represents your ability to do something, um, it has to be pretty abstract. It has to be something that can't just be like, you know, move your bicep this much with this many Newtons of force. Like it's definitely not that, right? Uh, because otherwise you would just be hopeless in interacting with a changing environment, which is, which is what we do rather effortlessly. So I think, um, 
I think you're probably right. I think that there is a, uh, an, a very important in motor skills, a very important uh, role for both practice and the feedback from the natural environment in tuning those skills. I will say that, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of came to in this is that the sort of more traditional, more old school approach to skill learning, I do think has merits in the sense that if you're not in the ballpark for the right skill, like if you, if you're not acquiring the skill in broadly the right way, the old sort of idea that like doing a lot of practice, doing the wrong thing gets bad habits and they're very hard to get out of. I think that's probably still true. So the, the example I've been using to kind of make clear with people from a motor skill point of view is, you know, if you're learning to type on a keyboard, a very natural way to start is hunting and pecking, <laughs> like using two fingers and, and looking at the keyboard and, and doing that. And if you do that enough, you can be a proficient hunter and pecker, I guess, and do it with enough speed that you can get by doing emails but that's never going to spontaneously turn to touch typing. Like they just rely on like a different kind of way of processing, you know, your, okay, I'm using the A key as always with my, my pinky finger. That's just not something you do when you're hunting and pecking. And so I think obviously with like a coach, a lot of times what you're doing is guiding people so that whatever kind of dynamic movement pattern their body generates to deal with the fact that they're a different size, they have different strength, different musculature, all that kind of stuff. You want them to be in the kind of basin of attraction of like a good movement pattern so that they're doing it sort of right. And, you know, without that ability to learn observationally, to learn kind of didactically from a coach or a teacher, it's very difficult to, to do that. I mean, uh, there's, I'm sure if I just started learning some sport and I didn't have any guidance, I didn't have any YouTube videos to show me the right way to do it. Very easy for you to just like have bad habits. And then you get to a coach five years later and they're like, Oh, you're doing it wrong. And it's very difficult for you to undo that. So I think that's sort of where it happens is that often you're getting in the zone and in the right kind of starting place for those skills. I mean, the actually your, your, um, phrase there which i might have to steal actually uh the base basin of attraction i really like that <laughs> that's, notion that's jargon but, but in, 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 yeah, yeah. no yeah. no no i love it i mean in many yeah. ways it's um it, it speaks to your um your ability to put together words as a writer um well but the, I, the, I, the basin oh sorry yeah yeah you know, i go, just wanted on, to go. elaborate because it comes from system series so like basin of attraction is that you have this idea that like there's some um uh some sort of landscape of of moving skills and there's a set, there's a quality to them. And so you can, you can sort of move toward a kind of central point. Like you get practice gets you close. So is it hunting and pecking? You're getting more and more fast and smoother and more efficient, but it still remains hunting and pecking. That's the, that's the sort of yeah. the, the, like what you're asymptotically approaching when you're doing that. So uh, it's not just an invention of mine, but it is a little bit jargony. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I like, but I, I actually really like the metaphor as well, because it's almost this idea that you can actually be quite skillful with environments and, you can kind of guide people towards sort of more optimal movement solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the metaphor people often use is it's a bit like a, a marble on a a, a stretched yeah. piece of uh, fabric, and like it can it'll it'll move towards the area that you know you get into, and you can actually be quite you can manipulate the fabric, and then the marble will move into different areas. And what you're doing is you're, and this is something you also talk about, which is this notion of problem solving being search. So actually what you're doing is you're modifying the search space and mm -hmm. then people find different solutions as opposed to yeah. saying, this is the solution that you're always going to need forever and I'm going to give it you now and then off you go sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's often what you're doing. Like in, in learning to move, um, there's a lot of variables, right? There's lots of ways you could potentially solve some kind of movement problem. And uh, one of the ways that our body kind of solves is you just try things and then there's a little bit of error correction feedback. So this that's that idea of like moving down to this basin of attraction. There's some landscape of solutions. And as you keep doing something, you make it more efficient because you're getting this like feedback from the environment of, you know, I'm going down the hill with my skis and like, oh, that was a bit bumpier. I need to make my legs a little bit more tense. And you're doing this not even always consciously. Your body is just... At a, at a procedural level, learning that this is how you need to make these adjustments. But at the same time, uh, because this space is so vast, there's many, often many different ways that you could solve something. And so it's possible that you, if you start off far away from the solution, it's either going to take you a lot of practice or you might pick up a bad habit, which like it works under the current constraints, but it's not going to be good in all situations. So I know I, I have a whole chapter dedicated to this um, sort of unlearning problem, which can be a very big one in, in athletics, where if you if you really 
train a movement solution very well can be very difficult to learn an alternate one, even if the first one is sort of deficient. So anyone who's been a lifelong hunter and pecker on the keyboard um, may be kind of daunted because they know that learning to touch type is going to be a drop of performance for a while until you become fluent with the new movement. And even then you're probably going to, in a moment of stress, kind of go back to hunting and pecking again. Yes, as someone who's been trying to teach myself to touch type, uh, it is very <laughs> difficult when you're under pressure not to go back yeah. to hunting and pecking when you just need yeah, that key yeah. that you're looking for. Exactly. Um, so um, uh, this this talks about, um, I, I mentioned earlier on, we talked about nonlinear learning and, and you, you title it, improvement is not a straight line. Yeah. So I think we've touched on that a little bit, but I'm interested a little bit more on that on that topic. Yeah, so this is interesting. I, I found this... Um this idea that like a lot of mastery involves unlearning uh, to be a kind of a theme that comes up in a lot of different domains. So that's why I wanted to write this chapter was that there's sort of parallels. Like I, I, you know, I talk about Tiger Woods and his sort of somewhat infamous decision to like rebuild his golf stroke uh, when he was at the peak of his career, which has been like endlessly debated by, um, you know, sports fans. But it, it kind of comes from this idea that, you know, in a lot of movement skills, again, like with the ones that we we're talking about, you can get really fluent with a kind of a bad habit. And then it can be hard to get better to get better. You have to essentially stop doing what feels comfortable, do something else. And sort of start from scratch and build a new uh, movement pattern that will sort of eventually override the old one. But this doesn't just apply to learning uh, physical skills. I mean, there's a whole literature on misconceptions where people essentially have these sort of naive folk theories of physics, of economics, of all sorts of disciplines, which we have scientific information. And this can present a real difficulty for the teacher of science to explain you know, how physicists think about things because people go in and they have all these ideas that are just wrong about how stuff moves. <laughs> and then that leads them to making correct predictions and it makes it harder to learn the, the deeper theories. And this is true of many domains. It's even true of a lot of like fairly simple, what we often think of as fairly simple skills. I, I talk about Robert Siegler. He has a lot of research on how kids learn to do arithmetic. So how do you add two numbers? And he shows that instead of the way we normally think about it is like, well, there's one way to learn how to do it. We actually use like several different methods. So there's, we start by counting from zero on, on our both hands, and then you count from the bigger one number, and then you count from the bigger number, and then you just learn to add those two together. You just do directly remember that what the answer was. And these various methods kind of compete with each other for a while. And so it's not the case that you're just learn one skill and you just get steadily better at it, that for complicated skills of which he uses this as an example, probably we have several different ways of doing it. And those ways shift over time as we get, you know, as we get more experience, we get more practice, we stop doing it one way, we start doing it another way. And so this idea of uh, non-monoticity, that's sort of the academic word for not being a straight line, but this idea that when we're learning, we're not just, you know, learn the right technique and just get steadily better at it over time. But rather we're learning multiple ways of doing things that a new way maybe is going to take over an old way. Once we have more experience, um, th th these things are very interesting because it suggests that often in our path to improvement, we're not just again, do it and then keep repeating it. We're getting better. We're having to constantly make things up, learn new techniques, suppress old bad techniques, this kind of thing. Yeah. And it, it struck me i mean i remember it's quite early on in the chapter you actually you know you i'm i'm really into my golf at the moment and um you talk about like you know there's quite the dangers actually of some of this stuff yeah. um particularly the assumption being that you know if you continuously you know look for different solutions all you're doing is basically adding to your repertoire but actually if you take somebody who particularly like you you talk about sevi biasteros you know who's an individual who learned to play the game, you know, fa famously, the you know, story goes, he had a three iron on the beach, you know, so he, yeah. he learned a very, very natural way of playing the game that was not an instructed way and developed a series of movement capabilities um, and, and an ability to play the game from anywhere, you know, his, his escapes were always famous. Mm -hmm. And then the minute he went into a different mode thinking he was going to try and sort of rebuild his swing which is the classical yeah. thing and all of a sudden it became about something much more alien much more delivered to him in an alien way than his natural learning approach and as you say 
never to be seen again, never played competitively or never, or at least never competed at the same level ever again. Yeah. And it's sometimes to me thinks that there's a great deal of danger sometimes, isn't there in these kinds of this sort of thinking of the, yeah. the linear learning approach is the way that we're always going to find improvement. Well, I mean, I think, uh, every time you do research on these kinds of things, like often you encounter a body of research. So in, in my case, I was talking about these various examples of non-monotonic learning, some of these theoretical ideas. And then you go shopping around looking for uh, what's a good story that I could use to highlight it. And I'd heard about this Tiger Woods changing his golf stroke kind of thing. And so it was very interesting digging into that story about this. I really think it kind of captured this um, this risk because you know obviously at least for the first time he changed his swing it worked out for tiger like he, he did quite well after he started working with his first swing coach a little bit less well after the second swing coach and then you know there's debates about whether the the further improvements were at all advisable but but just this idea that like you know um scott eden the sports journalist that i cite uh, in, the, in in that chapter uh, just talks about how like basically people just thought he was insane for doing this because th there was a lot of idea that, you know, you're, you've spent a lot of time golfing, even when he was making his first swing change, he'd spent a lot of time golfing. This is a very well-trained habit, if it were, or, or a movement pattern, if we want to be, um, a little less mechanistic about it. Like that basin of attraction, he's way at the bottom of that. Well, and so to learn a different technique, is is very difficult it's very likely to encounter difficulties because that movement pattern is so automatic so reflexive to him that if he learns a new way of doing it he's going to have to have an enormous amount of practice for that new pattern to compete with the old pattern and you know it's probably the case that even though i use the word unlearning colloquially we probably don't unlearn anything so once you learn something it's probably somewhere in your brain and if you you know, are in situations of stress or pressure, which obviously a major golfing tournament is full of those moments. It's very natural to fall back on old patterns. And so you can get in these sort of choking situations where you're doing something not the way you want to do it, an old way of doing it because of stress, because of these things. So it's in some cases to Tiger's credit that he was able to push through that, but it also shows, you know, there was a definite risk involved in in taking those kinds of um, major recalibration. And, and as he put up the example of Seve, I mean, it doesn't always turn out in your favor. I mean, it's so the, the Tiger is an endlessly fascinating sort of, sort of story, not least of which, mm -hmm. because what isn't often written about with Tiger is... He had a really quite unique upbringing within the game. Mm -hmm. He had a very unique upbringing anyway. I mean, yeah. a lot of the yeah. strengths of him comes from his mental strength, which is derived mm -hmm. from, you know, the sort of the Eastern philosophies that were practiced by his mother. And he often talks about the fact that he played in a, often in a sort of semi-meditative state. But mm -hmm. anyway, I digress. The interesting thing is, is that I was very fortunate at one time to meet his, his junior coach, a guy called um, Rudy Duran. And... Okay. Um, and he had a he owned an eighteen hole par three course that wasn't far from where the woods. And every Saturday morning, he would play around with Tiger. This is when Tiger was like five or something, right? And uh, oh, wow. he'd play a round of golf with Tiger's father and him. And he said all he would do is they would play together, and he would wait for the coachable moment. So the unique yeah. experience of Tiger was that he learned to play. And I actually asked I asked Rudy this question, yeah. and I said. How much time did you spend kind of on the driving range working on kind of swing and things? And how much time yeah. are you on the course? He said 85% of the time was on the golf course. And then the yeah. only time we went to the range was when we discovered something on the golf course that we needed to work a little bit more on. Mm -hmm. So Tiger's whole kind of upbringing from very, very early age was learning to play the game of golf and the challenges that it, it, it threw at him. And then he would then refine those skills later on when he discovered something that he couldn't quite solve in the environment. And apparently yeah. when he was in his middle teens, one of his biggest challenges was because he had such a wide movement repertoire. His biggest mm -hmm. challenges was he'd see about 10 different solutions to the to the shot problem and he couldn't focus down to one. So he had to learn how to sort of focus down to one. Yeah. And then when he did his, ch his swing changes later on, I actually believe at that stage that wasn't him. It was it was written about as being he's rebuilding his swing. No, what mm -hmm. he discovered was because he's this constant sort of developing, you know, he's still that child playing the game. It's one of the reasons he'd hardly ever miss a cut as well, because he could always get the ball in the hole from wherever he was. But what he would do was he would basically, when he sw he discovered something, he he didn't have the movement repertoire for the challenges that the game was presenting to him now. 
So what he then went about was setting about finding the new movement repertoire that he knew he needed. So he didn't necessarily change his swing. He added to it. And I think that's a kind of an interesting sort of like way of looking at how that all took place. Well, yeah, I think it is interesting um, when you think about performers in many domains, how they add to their repertoire. And I think you're right. I think sometimes there's a sort of unthinking quality ascribed to this so that it's sort of like, oh, well, you're just a machine and you're applying pattern A and then you apply pattern B. But uh, if you think about, you know, good writers or something like this, it's not even so much about, okay, well, I'm I'm writing badly and I'm writing better now, but often about having more ways you can tackle the same problem. So I used the example of Octavia Butler earlier in the book, but she's she's a good example. She had this uh, advice for students when they were getting stuck with things is go and find like 10 examples. So if you're struggling with openings, go find like a dozen people whose openings for stories you like and copy them down word for word. And the idea here wasn't to copy them, but to see these are the ways you can start a story. And like, so if you're stuck, here's 12 different ways you can do it. And I think that's an important part of what you're doing when you are um, getting into those sort of more nuanced ages of your craft is that you are like in getting increasing distinctions. You're getting increasing levels of detail from the environment where you can be like, this is why this is the right move in this right situation. So it's not even just about, okay, I've got this library of patterns, but you, you've very much tuned in so that, okay, there's these 12 ways I can do it. And I'm going to pick this one and this is why it's best. And, and that's, I think all why it's often very difficult to learn something to that level is because the complexity just keeps going up and you have so many more different situations that you have to respond to. I mean, chess players, that's clearly what they're doing is that, you know, is you don't just learn, okay, well, I'm going to try to mate the, the king right now. No, you, you learn all these like increasingly fine um, discriminations you need to make about the chess game in order to figure out what move is, is the best one to play. Yeah, it's interesting because chess is fascinating because there's so many, there's like almost like an infinite number of possibilities. Yeah, um, yeah. And But the interesting thing about chess players is they've done an experiment, haven't they? I'll probably get this wrong, but mm -hmm. where they, they're basically pattern recognizers, aren't they? So if you give them like an end game or something, they'll kind of work out the, the solution really quite quickly. But if you put the pieces in random places that they wouldn't ordinarily be, they're no better than a beginner. Yeah. Yeah, so this um, this is a really important research result. So uh, chess is like has a really long history within cognitive psychology. It's like one of the favorite games that people like to study for this. And so uh, William Chase and uh, Herbert Simon they replicated this um, work of an earlier Dutch psychologist, Adrian de Groot. And one of the things they found was that um, better players do not seem to search deeper into the chess problem than not so good players. Now the range restriction there was between. Players who are kind of like casual weekend club players and like grandmasters or masters players. So between like pretty good players and like really good players, it turns out if you expand the range to include like rank beginners, like better players do actually look further ahead, but not that much further ahead, not enough to explain the difference in their ability. So the difference in the ability seems to be that high level players have a much larger library of uh, chess patterns they recognize certain plays that they're able to almost perceive the board in terms of it's imbued with meaning of like this is what's going on in this situation that beginners are not able to do so one of the ways you can test that is you arrange the board you let them look at it you clear the board and then you ask them to like recreate it and if the board positions are natural they, they come up from organic play so they are something that maybe would have occurred during a game uh, grandmasters and, and higher level players are much better at reproducing the board than beginners. And this is one of the reasons why grandmasters can play like nine consecutive blindfolded games, which would just be impossible for a beginner because they only have to remember like a few little data points. Like it's a story that they're hearing. And it's like, if you pick up a book you are reading and you're just like, oh yeah, I remember this is what was going on in this book. And you can just pick up from where you left off. Whereas for a beginner, it's just a mess. Um, however, it does seem that grandmasters, even if you just like, make these weird permutations of the game where they don't actually um, have any experience with it. They do play better. So it's not the case that like, you know, it's just pure pattern recognition that drives a competitive play, but the, the experiments do show that the, 
this chunking ability, this ability to take complex patterns of information, store them in memory, and use that to essentially be smarter within the game than beginners uh, is a major component of how um, not only chess players, but all sorts of expert performance. So I, I, I kind of allude to some citations of the book, but this finding about chess players applies to like dozens of other fields. So this is not just about chess players. This seems to be how expertise works in many domains. Uh, it's 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 almost like there's a it's almost like there's a i don't know like it's a short cutting mechanism and I, so i going back to the sort of movement movement domains there's a lot of mm -hmm. sort of research around like uh, amazing soccer players um and their experiences and a lot of them have so if you take for example it's famous that sort of you know the, a lot of the brazilian the very very highly skilled brazilian players you know their movement development was in what they call futsal um, it's very small spaces. Football to allow football in the room. A lot of I don't have to teach you Brazilian. You li you li live there for a year. Um, <laughs> but you know, but very much in small spaces. But uh, of course, playing a game in a small space, but with close proximity opponent, close proximity uh, teammates. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're seeing, like you know, a turbo charge, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of essentially kind of football video. That then, of course, when they then go into a, a different environment, the sort of more formal environment, you know, they're, they're, the recognition of the movements, they're able to sort of process really quickly. They're able to deal with small space. They're able to deal in, yeah. you know, in different environments. And and that, again, is a sort of a very similar thing, I think. Well, it's interesting that what you're talking about, about like the Brazilian footballers. I had heard that before um, that, you know, the the sort of casual pickup games in Brazil are maybe more formative than like the the American you know, little league soccer, <laughs> soccer coach uh, drills. But, but I think there's something also uh, an interesting question that this kind of brings up, which is, is the real environment that you typically practice in always the best for skill growth? And I think one of the things that came up from my reading the research is the action, actually, the answer is often no, that sometimes the, the typical environment that you practice in um, doesn't have uh, enough difficulty, enough constraints to really like force you to learn the correct pattern. So, um, you know, an, an example that came up uh, when, when when looking at the research was talking about uh, pilot training that typically when you're flying a plane, like nothing bad happens. <laughs> you're just flying yeah. and, you know, everything's good. And you can rack up a lot of hours with that and, you know, it, and it'll be okay. Whereas the way that they do a lot of um, pilot training now, which is sort of like a kind of hard one lesson, is, well, you want to like put all these various mechanical failures of the plane and like put it in, you know, I, I talk about one of the early um, Air Force um, pilot trainers, you know, would just like put the plane into like spins and dives and like, okay, recover from this. And no, those things don't happen very often, but those are the experiences that force you to like develop the ability to learn. So I'm thinking about the Brazilian soccer players playing in these like kind of cramped spaces. Then in some ways that environment is more challenging. It has... Uh, you know, more constraints. So you have to develop solutions for dealing with problems. It just maybe don't come up very often in the, the, in the, on the soccer field, the big wide open green field. And because of that, you're maybe learning some tools in a much more rapid fashion that when you are in the actual environment, it might've taken you a long time to learn them. And so I think of that in a lot of spaces that, you know, people who work in kind of constrained, rigorous, highly variable environments very often progress faster than someone who just simply does the thing that they're trying to get good at because of this effect. So if you think about writing, for instance, a lot of the best writers, you know, they have a background as journalists in um, newsrooms. And what, what that forces you to do if you're doing nonfiction you have to write for an editor, you have rigorous standards for reporting, and you get like tons of repetitions of like, okay, go cover this story and come back to me with like some thing. Whereas someone like myself who doesn't have that experience, it's a lot harder for me to simulate that because it's very easy for me to just like, ah, I'll just write a blog article and publish it. And I could do that for 10, 15 years and still not learn some of the things that you'd need to learn to do like high quality reportage. And so I think that's something that when we are choosing environments and choosing how we want to improve, sometimes choosing that that sort of more extreme version of the environment can be beneficial because it introduces new constraints, new variability that uh, you wouldn't get just doing your day-to-day -day job. Yeah, you, you, you just made me, reminded me of a, there's a story, I think, I'm pretty sure that uh, Dan Coyle writes about it in the talent mm. code, I think. Um, but he, uh, and it's about the, the Beatles and um, and they're kind of the, 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 like how they sort of hothouse their musical ability because they happen to get 
I think it was a weekly gig playing in a club in somewhere in Hamburg, Germany. Was it? I think Hamburg. Hamburg that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and of course, like they're basically playing live. You know, when you said constrained, rigorous, highly variable environments, I think that was yeah. exactly that. Because apparently they sucked for quite a while. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, no, I think I think that's from Malcolm Gladwell's book, unless Dan Coyne also talks Gladwell, about it, uh, it from Outliers. Yeah. He he talks about the Beatles, but the the idea um, I think is also relevant to you know uh, like a lot of stand up comics that do a lot of you know you're doing open mic nights and this kind of thing. These these there's these sort of environments that they're going to accelerate your growth, particularly once you're sort of at a level where you can survive in them. Because I don't want to say like another thing that comes up with the research is that a lot of the things that work well for people at a certain level of skill don't work well at another level of skill. There's sort of a continuum, but the, the basic idea is that once you're sort of at a, a mediocre to like, okay, you have, you've, you sort of learned the basics, you have that repertoire, then um, the, the right kind of environment, I think really does make a difference because you know, it could be the constraints. We're talking about the cramped corridors forces you to learn movement solutions you wouldn't have learned if you're in a big open field. Um, rigors, feedback, like, you know, if you're in a newsroom and you, you know, sloppy with citing your sources, you're going to get slapped down pretty hard. You do that on a blog post, maybe nobody even notices. Um, there's also differences even just in the incentives, the peer networks you're in. I talk about the workshop method where like, you know, a really good way that people get good at writing novels is to be in these sort of intensive workshop environments where you have to publish, you have to write something every single night so that you can get dissected in the next day's class in front of your peers. I mean, this just creates this really rigorous feedback cycle, which forces improvement over a short period of time, which, I mean, you could just be like typing up novels for years and not get that experience that you can get over a couple of weeks in a, in a workshop. Imagine you had a similar experience in Spain because the minute you like mispronounce a word in Spain, they'll quite often give you quite a bit of visual feedback with their face. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the language learning experience too. Um, you know, another factor, and we we <laughs> there's so much stuff we we barely touched upon, but the the emotional factor is important too because you know my experience is that there's certain skills and languages being one of them where we often have a lot of awkwardness or uncomfortableness using the skill when we don't use it a lot. And I can even say this right now, this is a, this is a very hardwired thing. This isn't something that like, Oh, you know, some people are just bold and confident. Some people aren't. When we were doing this language learning project, which now was over a decade ago, when we were doing that project, uh, it was totally natural to speak terrible Spanish. <laughs> you know, in the first, like you were in three weeks we're you know, we're not speaking fluently. We're not being, you know, super proficient in this language, but it felt totally comfortable. It didn't feel like weird to go up to people and speak in bad Spanish. But now my Spanish is much better now than it was then. I don't speak it regularly. I don't speak it like, you know, every day I'm speaking Spanish. If you just said, okay, have this Spanish conversation right now, it would be a little bit of awkwardness, a little bit of like, oh, I forget this word and I feel a little bad and this kind of thing. And so part of it is just that when we are trying to build new skills, choosing an environment that can also help us um, quickly adapt emotionally to the needs of practice is, is important too. So a lot of these environments where you kind of go through this uh, rapid exposure, where you get exposed to some, what is initially a stressful situation, but then you accommodate and then you're like, oh, it's no problem doing it. Um, you can often get into a situation where you're able to get a lot more practice than if you have this sort of, oh, uh, you tried every once in a while kind of, kind of approach. So, um, one thing you're right, I'm jumping around, but one thing I thought that was really interesting is you, you give a nice framework around the kind of the learning process, which you sort of mm -hmm. basically characterize with um, see, do, um, and then feedback. feedback is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And um, and so I, wouldn't, I wonder if you like kind of what, what made you sort of like create that kind of architecture? Is that just what yeah. you sort of found in the research that sort of it, it, those buckets were natural? So two, yeah. So two reasons. The first reason was that um, there's like if you if you survey this literature, and we've been talking about it a lot, there's just like a myriad of little details of facts of things that are like, well, that's interesting and that's interesting. And so trying to step back and see the big picture is is hard. And uh, there's different ways of doing it. I mean, there's certainly uh, more academic ways that'll like talk about, well, this is the declarative and procedural system or neural nets or this kind of stuff. But from a pragmatic point of view, 
learning through observation, doing practice and getting feedback seem to be three fairly broad categories of uh, that, that contained is sort of like, you know, were umbrella terms that contained a lot of these details. So that was one reason is just, I wanted to create a framework that could integrate a lot of different ideas so that it wasn't just sort of a fairly narrow point. Like we could talk about variability, but we could also at the same time talk about exposure therapy. We could talk about um, cognitive load theory, all these different ideas. So that would be one. The second reason is that if you look at successful uh, pedagogy, so there's so many different ways of learning that have been tried in different cultures and different places from the classroom to the workplace to, you know, all sorts of things. And I survey a lot of them. And one of the sort of recurring themes is that something kind of like a learn from example, do practice, get feedback loop, however it's structured, is pretty common in the successful ones. So I talk about you know, direct instruction, which is this very successful methodology, particularly for teaching um, skills it, like like uh, like reading and mathematics to, to young children. And it really operates off of this, like, here's the example, do it yourself, feedback. And it's just doing that repeatedly. If you look at, um, uh, you can see this in uh, examples like I, I gave of science fiction writing. I gave the Octavia Butler example that like being able to see examples of good writing, doing it yourself, getting feedback. Again, you see the same thing. I use the example of the Tetris players and fighter jet pilots and all sorts of people. So this, this sort of through line of this fairly abstract motif of seeing, learning from other people, doing, getting practice and getting feedback recurs so many times that I think it represents something important about how people learn. That when you are missing one of these ingredients, you aren't able to learn from other people. So you're doing everything through trial and error and you know, you're, it, it doesn't often work very well. If you're not getting any practice, obviously you're not going to improve or you're not getting the right kind of practice. You're not going to improve. And if you don't have feedback, you don't have this ability to not only, not only feedback just from like a coach or from a teacher, but this sort of dynamic interaction with the environment. Once that link is severed, it's very hard to improve as well. So these three ingredients I thought were very important for someone who might be reading this book to reflect on, you know, what is the bottleneck? What is the thing that's keeping me from making improvements that I desire, whether it's your golf game or your career or what, what have you. And, you know, that just naturally suggests, okay, then maybe these are some ways you could fix it and improve. I guess this now, I think it speaks, I think to how a new generation, I think are finding a very natural way of learning because they have a, a, you know, a kind of almost like a bewildering array of mm -hmm. examples of others that they can observe. Go back to your Tetris yeah. example, but with anything now, you know, there's examples of other people doing it, and and then you then give it a go yourself. You can get some feedback because it either works yeah. or it doesn't work, and then you can go back to your observation. And that continuous cycle of learning is, I think, how has become a very natural way for young people in particular to learn, which makes me fearful because i still see so much of the sports world mm. sort of wedded to sort of old ideas around i must give you these particular movements mm. so that you, and i have to teach you them unfortunately in a way that's really not that enjoyable but it's so that you will then be proficient later and yeah you know it strikes me that you know you talk about 12 maxims for mastery but here what you're almost articulating in many ways is we might want to think about this a little bit differently, particularly when you've got a generation who view learning very differently from traditional notions of learning. And I think if yeah. we want to sort of keep pace and allow, for example, the physical space to compete with the virtual space, um, we're probably going to have to think about the way we provide those learning experiences in a very different way. Yeah. I mean, I think what you raised is a very good example. And I think it sort of points out some of the promise and perils of like these new developments in um, technology is that, yes, we do live in a world where, you know, if I want to look up how to do anything, pretty much, there's a YouTube video for it. There's a Wikipedia page. There's, you know, some course or class or thing online. So the potential is there. The potential to learn things is there. But there's also the problem of, well, first of all, is that what most people are doing, you know, online, you're like wasting time on your, you know, looking at random TikToks, you're just looking at cat videos, you're not actually learning something. And then the second issue is just finding the curating the information, getting that, like, getting to the point where I can, you know, if I have some home 
fix it problem. I can find the right video and actually apply it and use those things. So I tend to think that what we're, what we're in a world is sort of paradoxically where we have the ability to teach ourselves almost anything we want, but to be in a position to make use of that, to actually be able to take advantage of this just sort of information overload that we exist in this sort of saturated environment requires itself that we have a lot of training, that we have a lot of background knowledge that, you know, sometimes we don't have, sometimes we're not able to make use of it. So I think this is going to be a world in the future where the people who, you know, do educate themselves, do have uh, more knowledge, more skill. And, and to use an athletic example, like you have the sort of background of maybe different sports or different things like this, so that you have a lot of these different possibilities kind of in this abstract form in your head. Um, that you're able to take advantage of that. And so I, I do think we're kind of entering this world where, yeah, it's it's becoming easier for some and harder for others. And so I, I really try to write these books because I want to hopefully steer people into the easier for them category. So just to sort of, I guess, wrap this up, because we've, mm -hmm. we've kind of like, you know, I've taken us on a bit of a magical mystery tour yeah, yeah. through the book. <laughs> um, um, you on this point around this feedback and the link link around experience um one thing that really sort of grabbed me that i really liked was this this notion of noisy feedback so i wonder if you could expand on that idea yeah so in this particular context uh, context um there's an interesting set of research so we talked a little bit about expertise and we talked about like chess players and stuff and so a typical finding of this sort of domain was that it, with a lot of experience, people as, you know, chess players and technicians and musicians and this kind of stuff build these patterns, these repertoires of what happens. And they're able to make uh, really good judgments about what, what, you know, what chess move you should make, what's the winning uh, solution to this problem. And interestingly, like kind of in parallel with this research on expertise about like how wonderful experts are and how smart they are. There's been this other research of expertise, which has shown kind of how badly a lot of professionals make decisions. So examples include here, like hiring managers are just like wildly overconfident about how they are about picking prospective employees. Um, uh, you know, I, I give some examples. There's all this research showing that like psychiatrists are not particularly good at predicting patient outcomes compared to, you know, relatively simple kind of actuarial models where it's basically like, you know, you just tally up like pros and cons for this particular person. Often that doesn't beat expert judgment, even though it's something that can be done by a spreadsheet. Um, and so why is that? Why is it the case that, you know, we have some experts who just seem almost magical in their prowess and their ability that they clearly do better than normal people at these skills. And then there's other people who have like years of training and advanced degrees who don't do that well. And so the, the solution seems to be that when we're learning in environments where there's uh, not only the situation is noisy, it's uncertain. So you can make the same decision and get a different result. Um, you know, hiring someone's like that. Sometimes you hire them and they turn out great. Sometimes you hire them and they turn out to be a dud. But also if we don't get good feedback, we don't get good calibrating feedback about, you know, the, the actual results of our decisions, then we're not able to learn from that process. We're not able to fine tune our calibrate our decision making. And so we tend to rely either on, you know, our abstract theories or, or generalizations of things, or we rely on just, you know, we tended to make this decision in the past. So we just do it more and more and more. It just becomes more automatic. We feel more confident with it. And so I, I kind of, I wrote this chapter where I was contrasting some of these experts that sort of have a lot of confidence, but don't always make good decisions with people like poker players who live in an environment of uncertainty. You can make the same bet and get wildly different outcomes. It can be often quite difficult to decide whether or not you made the right decision. But until very recently, we're able to outperform computers in this domain so that there was a sense that poker players had real skill here, that if you were good at this game, you did a lot better than you know a fairly naive uh, model could apply. So the, the idea here is that poker players, they're, they're much able to learn, much better at learning from their track record. They're much better at um, calibrating their performance, learning from that uncertainty, and even just using models when they need to. So if you know your gut decision is not going to be very good here, if you have a model that says, okay, well, when the odds are this, you make this bet, you're going to be better player than someone who's just going off of gut feel all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, I think that's a, again, you know, this is a really interesting idea. And I, again, I think it's quite counterintuitive. I think a lot of people feel that, that learning should be 
remove it goes back to what i was saying earlier on about this variability being noise uh or signal like people are thinking very often that like you know you you kind of need to remove some of this messiness mm -hmm. in order to really learn where in actual fact it's the it's that kind of process of to a certain extent trial and error but it's almost like rapid trial and error but in a very safe to fail environment that's actually really turbocharging people's abilities yeah i mean i think part of the problem is that uh, when you have a situation where there's lots and lots of pieces of information that you have to integrate, um, what people seem to be bad at is like, okay, there's, let's say there's a dozen factors that might determine whether or not someone's a good employee, you know, their resume and who they were referenced by, where they went to school and their job experience. And all of them kind of give some information, but nothing is like this, the linchpin that just says, this is going to be the thing that matters. Uh, the default way that I think the brain works in processing those candidates is it's not like we take those 15 pieces of information, we all assign them a weight, and then we add them up, and then we get some kind of score. It's, we're not doing this either consciously or unconsciously. That's not how we're making that decision. If we were making that decision, we would do similarly to models that um, that that explicitly do this, that that's how they work. Instead, I think what we're doing is we're pattern matching. We're doing something similar to what the chess player is doing is that we see a candidate and they remind us of another candidate. And if the reminder is positive, if this example seems similar to another example that went well, then we give them a thumbs up. If it seems similar to an example that went bad, we give them a thumbs down. And the problem is that in the chess example, where it's a very deterministic environment, it's one where you have a uh, like quite fine discriminations on, on what's a good move, what's a bad move. This can actually work out fairly well because you're like, oh, this is this situation and this is the right move. I remember it. But if you're in a situation where it's more probabilistic, more spread out, then you have to be very careful because you can have like wildly misleading associations and you're not necessarily taking advantage of all the information. You're like, oh, well, when we hire people from this place, they're always good. But you're only looking at one piece of information, you're ignoring all the rest. And so, um, you know, the, the recommendation I give here is, is sort of twofold. One is if you're in a situation where you can't really learn that well from example, so you're the hiring manager and you don't have good feedback, you don't have good calibration to be able to like hone your intuition the way you'd want, it can often be very good to rely on sort of, you know, in some ways less intuitive, just, you know, you have some spreadsheet, these are the factors in their favor, these are the factors not in their favor, and you go for the one that's the highest, or that's at least the people who make the final round. This The second example is that if you want to train this ability, you need to have a lot better feedback, you need to have a lot better calibrating information, because otherwise, you know, when you just hire people, and you just see the ones that did well, but the nine out of 10 that you rejected, you have no idea when they go out in the world, whether or not they turn out to be good employees somewhere else. It's very difficult to acquire this information and to learn from from good examples. So I think that's another example of where we often fail is that in our complex real world, yes, we don't um, we don't actually have the information to become skilled at it. We don't actually have the feedback and we don't, we don't bother to set up mechanisms in our, in our places of work and our profession where we even track these things. You know, a little thing that my company did, which I mean, it's small, but it made a big difference for us was we actually like started tracking our predictions for sales when we would do like core sessions and like, this is the prediction. This is what actually happened. And it made our forecast way better because we used to just like guess, well, I think it'll probably do about this before, but we never calibrated. We never went back and like checked, okay, well, this is what we thought. And this is what actually happened. So we know whether we're overconfident or underconfident or, you know, what the overall trend lines are. Now we do that. I mean, that's just a really simple banal point, but I think that kind of um, extra calibration is very important because it's very rarely the default. It's hearing you talking about hiring, actually. Um, I think in the mm -hmm. parallel there for the sports world is uh, coaches have to make selection decisions. Um, <laughs> yeah. And particularly in the, space, in the world of talent, yeah. um, you know, very often, you know, you're, you're selecting for a squad, a representative squad. And mm -hmm. I think there's some parallel research. I think it's Joe Baker from uh, York University uh, who who was saying that actually uh, that coaches in particular, they, they overestimate their ability to make uh, yeah. selection decisions about performers or potential performers and are actually not much better than the lay person in making the decision around who do you... So the reality of that yeah. and the real, again, the real fear with that is... That what we're doing is potentially deselecting a whole heap of potentially talented youngsters 
based on yeah. some quite flawed information. So I think there's some well, really I mean, good parallels there. Wasn't that the whole Oakland A's money ball kind of point was that a lot of these uh, talent scouts had their own intuitions honed from years, but they weren't super accurate. And so you could have some nerd with a spreadsheet being like, actually, we want to select for this statistic and we can do it. And it turns out to win. Now, I don't want to go into like, you know, arguing over the the money ball uh, point too much, but I think that the research does show that in these environments where the in the decision making so that we're talking about a fairly narrow class of of skills first i want to make that clear that we're talking about judgment decisions where you have to like say you know this or this or make this decision or do that it's not the same yeah. as like typing or kicking a soccer ball because there's no real analog to like a spreadsheet there it's not like a spreadsheet can you know kick a field goal or something like that we're talking about judgments but if we're talking about judgments especially in high uncertainty uh lots of noise and there's lots of the information that is available that would tell you whether or not this is a good decision is diffuse. So you have to take into account many, many, many pieces of information. And it just seems like the way the brain is hardwired is that it's better at pattern matching than aggregating. And because of that, it, uh, the pattern matching tendency tends to take over. And it seems to be the case that if you get more experience in these fields uh, without some sort of proper humiliating recalibrating kind of experience which is constantly knocking you down and saying no no you don't actually understand this is just to get more and more confident and more and more cocky and more assured of your position and so um you know this has been behind a lot of the work of people like daniel kahneman who have this sort of general skepticism of of whole broad swaths of experts of people who pat themselves on the back for how smart they are when it's like yeah but you're not actually looking at your track record where when we actually measure it you don't seem to do so well even though you're so confident that you're the smartest person on earth and so i think a little bit of humility is important but even more important than the humility is you know you need to actually track some of these things if you want to have genuine skill yeah uh, kahneman's book noise is a fascinating expose in the flaws <laughs> yes, of human too, judgment yeah. isn't it hey listen yeah. i'm conscious that uh, we're coming up on time and um you've you've got a lot a lot of other things to be doing but um a couple of questions so firstly like look I'm, sure. I'm i'm like i'm most of the way through this but and i'm really i've really enjoyed it actually um it's it's it, i know you, they talk about like the is this a difficult second album a difficult second book but uh you know it's a great job um particularly because you've had two young ones at the same time through that process um i also know you write a brilliant blog as well and people can get hold of that so what's the best way of people kind of like immersing themselves in all the stuff that you produce yeah. So, I mean, you can go to my website, scotthyoung.com. We have like, I don't know, more articles than you can read. I think it's like 1,600 or something right now. It's like two decades of writing there. There's multiple book-length things on a lot of these topics from learning to motivation to psychology. So there's lots of resources there you can dig into. And then also check out the book. So we talked about both uh, my first book, Ultra Learning. Um, we also have recorded an episode about that. And then also Get Better at Anything is the new one. Uh, highly recommend, you know, just checking it out if you want to dive deeper into some of these these topics. Scott, I've really appreciated you taking the time to join me today. Uh, thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever the third one brings us. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciated talking to you too. It's always really gratifying to talk to someone who uh, really cares and understands about a lot of these subjects. So it's been a really, really pleasant conversation.